Hey, everybody, this is Sunday Postscript for August the 6th. Um, Today, we studied the back half of John 18 at Emmanuel Baptist Church. I'm Carrie. This is the Growing in the Gospel YouTube channel. This video I do, this particular video I do once a week. We call it Sunday Postscript. It's just a follow-up on the morning message. We've been journeying through the Gospel of John verse by verse. It's been such a rich and a wonderful study. We're also preparing to go forward into Revelation, also a book inspired by the Lord Jesus through the pen of John. So today was um, being loved enough to follow the true king. And today was kind of a categorical uh, point. It's like a watershed moment where the narrative takes us into the trial of Jesus with Pilate. So we've come through the Garden of Gethsemane, the arrest, uh, the first three trials of the Jews. Now they, they're bringing him to Pilate because they don't have the authority to do what they want to do to him. They don't just want him dead. They want him crucified in particular. They don't want him stoned. They probably could have gotten away with that, um, but they want him completely shamed in a very public and a very brutal way. They hate him with the most vicious kind of hatred. And they, they want him, Deuteronomy says that someone who's hanged on a tree is cursed by God. And so they, they want to be able to say to his followers, thousands of them, he can't be Messiah because he was hanged on a tree. He was cursed by God. They're missing the whole point that Jesus came to be cursed for us. He came to absorb the curse that we deserve. So, of course, he was cursed by God. And Deuteronomy was not just an arrow pointing to someone that God rejects. It was an arrow pointing to the Messiah who would receive the curse that I deserved. But you know what else I I didn't get to mention today? It's just the, the idea that they hated him so violently. And to the religious leaders, the, he was so despicable. He was so despised. They didn't just want him dead. They didn't just want him to suffer. They wanted him to suffer in the worst imaginable way. And they didn't want him. Let's let's uh, let's play the devil's advocate for a minute. And let's let's go with their narrative just hypothetically. And let's say that in the narrative they're creating, this is just a man, just a Jewish man, not God, not the Messiah, not the Christ, not the Savior. If they were being the people of God if they were representing accurately God's heart, they would have wanted him to repent and come into uh, grace. They would want him to experience the love of God. But no, they wanted him not just to, in the eyes of others, be cursed. They literally wanted him to be cursed by God. Um, They they were wishing, uh, it would be like a New Testament Christian not wanting someone to be saved but like wishing them to hell, wishing them to judgment and to eternal separation from God. So that's a that's a, just a thought about how um, systemic, how deeply rooted and how comprehensive, how like full of darkness and rage and hate their hearts really were. So we began the morning by talking about UAPs, unidentified alien or uh, aerial phenomenon. Um aliens, UFOs, the hearings on Capitol Hill, and the idea of are we alone in the universe? And we explored that question uh, about, number one, how lonely it would be, how sad it would be to find out we are alone in the universe. That just means like this is as good as it gets. And that narrative just falls all to pieces. But then the idea that emphatically, no, we're not alone. And Jesus said he came from another world. He came from another dimension into this world for a very specific purpose, and that he's going into that other world, that world. And he says in that, he says that he's a king and that there he's the king of a kingdom in that world, in that dimension. And he came here and and he talks a lot about his kingdom that he is shaping and it is growing. And it is both spiritual and to some degree material in our lives. We are becoming followers and every person that becomes a follower is a new part of that kingdom. But It doesn't really become fully physical or manifest or consummated until Jesus comes back when he will consummate his kingdom. But John 18, Jesus is being brought now from the Jewish trials into the trial with Pilate. And we unpacked the narrative and we talked through some of the the cultural dynamics at play, Jewish government, 
uh, Roman government, uh, the Jewish leaders, the person of Jesus, these storms that were brewing around Jerusalem that were political, geopolitical in nature, and spiritual in nature. They bring um, Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate is a very interesting character in this story because he's so, so, so conflicted, and he's so torn between his politics, his marriage, and his own spiritual life. So politically, he was sent there by, appointed by Caesar, and he's climbing the system, he's climbing the political system, and he was sent there to govern Judea, which is like the worst place to govern in the Roman Empire. Nobody wanted, nobody, nobody liked the Jews. Nobody wanted to be there. Um, so he's in this kind of this backwater, wild west of the Roman Empire, and the Jews are really difficult to deal with because they they've so perverted God's religious system into this pseudo government cartel kind of uh, mafia like organization that's incredibly wealthy and extorting the people with from a lot of money then you've got the roman tyranny you know the roman empire layering on top of that and in league with these religious leaders so that they're they're coming to these compromises and solutions so the jewish leaders only had authority to go so far with jesus then they turned him over to the romans and and pilate gets stuck in the middle he questions him he got a he got a text message from his wife that said don't mess with this innocent man i had a bad dream about him that's always, you know, we, we know how that goes as men when we get messages from our wives. Um, he sees that Jesus is innocent, and he declares that multiple times. Finally, he sees a way out by sending Jesus to Herod when Jesus when he finds out Jesus is from Galilee. Herod rules the region of Galilee, but he's in Jerusalem for the feast, for the Passover. It's kind of like New Year's Day in, in Times Square. There's an increased presence of, of, of um, not only law, law enforcement, the soldiers, the Roman garrisons, but also um, kind of the elite people that show up for the feast. So the Roman governor and the Roman king from Galilee is there. Herod doesn't get what he wants out of Jesus, sends him back to Pilate and says, he's your problem. So now Pilate is, be- is pinned between his wife's opinion, his own personal opinion that Jesus is at the very least innocent and possibly something far, far more. And the interaction between Jesus and Pilate indicates that there's a struggle going on in Pilate. But he's sent there to, to keep peace and keep tax dollars flowing to Caesar. So if he doesn't please the Jews that this is a growing riotous situation of unrest, and if it gets out of control, uh, Herod's going to probably blame Pilate for that. So he doesn't want to crucify Jesus, but doesn't see a way out. Finally, he proposes let's uh let's let him go because it's passover and we have a tradition of letting a soul, a, a prisoner go they had a cross they had a crucifixion execution scheduled for three criminals and he he chose uh one of the worst of the three i think barabbas and he he's pitting the release of barabbas against the release of jesus and he's saying okay look i'll give you the choice you i'll release barabbas or jesus he's he's sure they'll choose jesus because barabbas is a murderer jesus is a healer and at this point, uh, Jesus has been humiliated and discredited, and he clearly didn't set up his, his, his geopolitical kingdom. So Pilate's thinking, well, um, maybe this will suffice. He does not. He underestimates the Jews' um, hatred and their will to get Jesus crucified. He also is completely unaware of the spiritual, um, the providential, the prophetic dynamic that's at play that Jesus will be crucified. He's predicted it three times. The Old Testament predicts it. Um, Jesus himself, three different times, said, I will be lifted up, which is, in in a modern first century vernacular, the expression that I will be crucified. So he knew well that he would be crucified. And um, so finally, Pilate sees no way out. He washes his hands of the matter. He turns Jesus over and says, crucify him, and he says, his blood is on your hands. And interestingly, the Jews in another gospel say, his blood be on us and our children. It's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. At the very end of John's narrative, uh, Barabbas is set free. And so what did we lift off this today? Uh, I won't uh, be much longer. I'm just checking time here real quick. Sorry for that. Um, We lifted off, first of all, Jesus is revealed as kind of three figures in this text. The first is king. The second is truth, and the third is life or redemption, salvation. So as king, Jesus flatly says, 
I am a king. I came from another world. My kingdom is not of this world. And, and earlier in the text, you know, I'm going back to that kingdom. Then I'm coming back to receive believers to myself and you'll be, they'll be with me. So clearly he, he is claiming to be a king and to have a kingdom and he's inviting us into that kingdom. So I said, as Jesus, as King, Jesus is my loving Lord. And we just, we just really pressed into the idea that we all kind of don't want anyone telling us what to do. We kind of don't want lordship or a king. And yet on the other side of the coin, we desperately want it and need it. Um, and the best illustration I can give you is that, you know, when we're wanting to do our own thing, it's kind of like Jesus, you back away and let me just do my thing. Um, but when things go badly or life comes undone, our first expression often is, oh my God. And it is a cry. It's it's a real revelation. It's a peek into the subconscious and the weak inner world of all of our hearts where we are profoundly vulnerable. And when life does what life does to us, we immediately want a king. We want a powerful intervention. I shared a story and I didn't get to share all all of it in the uh, second service, but I'll share it with you now. Uh, went down to hear Jim Cimbala preach at the end of a Shane and Shane concert with the Brooklyn Tabernacle Singers. And he told the story of the wedding of Cana of Galilee, which I love, and the, the idea that this wedding feast needed a miracle. They ran out of wine and they had a desperate situation and they needed a miracle. And Jesus saved the day. Jesus made the miracle. And then he just pressed into, you know, the fact that we all need miracles in our lives. We all need moments where God intervenes and comes through. And he asked this question. He said, why was the why did the miracle happen at the wedding? Why did it happen? And of course, the crowd was talking to him and stuff. And they were saying, you know, because, because um, Jesus was there. That was the, the most common answer. And then he said, so why was Jesus there? You know, like, like the miracle happened because Jesus was there. But why was Jesus there? And he said, Jesus was there because he was invited. And this is the the beauty of the kingship of Jesus. It is an objective reality, but uh, Jesus never forces his way or presses his way into someone's life. He, he wants us to come to the point where we admit willingly that not only do we need a savior, we don't just need a ticket out of judgment and a ticket into heaven. We do need that, but we need much more than that. We need a king. We need someone to govern and guide and direct our lives. We are not designed for that kind of leadership in our own lives. And Jesus coming and claiming to be the king is a revoke. It's a revocation. He revokes our authority to rule our lives. So when we get Jesus, we don't just get a savior. We get a king. And, and, and not only is, is that a real thing? It's also a beautiful and a wonderful thing because in all of our lives, we really want a king, and we need to admit humbly that we need a king. But it does translate, it does extrapolate out to, am I just playing at this? Am I just, am I, do I just want salvation and not his guidance and direction on a daily, hour by hour, week by week basis? Because that's, that's, play, that's playing. Um, he has authority, and it is, it is, it's not just that he saves me. It's that he is a good, loving Lord and wants to lead and guide my life. And so it is on me to surrender, to invite him in, to be the king that he already is and to submit myself to do what he says. And uh, so I love that that truth. The second truth we explored is that as truth, Jesus is my standard of right. We talked about how truth is uh, becoming almost uh, non-discernible in our modern society, from AI to uh you know, virtual reality and, and deep fakes and all kinds of things. There's all kinds of ways to, to package lies to make them look so, so believable. And it's really becoming harder and harder to know what is true in the political spectrum, in society and culture. What is true? And Pilate poses this question to Jesus because Jesus says, I'm truth. I came to bear witness of truth. And everyone on the side of truth listens to me by implication, meaning if you reject me, you're choosing lies and error and deception. Uh, And that's a categorical claim. But we all have to have an objective standard, an external standard for what is truth, where will we look for truth. For me, that's Jesus. I hope for you, that's Jesus. In a world where confusion is reigning, we need to try the spirits. And we need to rest in the fact that Jesus is truth 
and uh, he wins in the end. The third thought quickly was that as life, Jesus accomplishes my redemption. And we just explored the end of the story with Barabbas being released. And it's amazing to me to think that they had a cross, they had nails, they had a hammer, they had an execution scheduled. It was a crucifixion of three criminals. Barabbas was one of them. He would have been on the middle cross. But the morning arises, the soldiers come to the cell where Barabbas is awaiting his crucifixion. He knows he's on death row and he knows it was his last night. So he wakes up knowing it's time. I'm dying today. The soldiers come. I can hear the keys rattle. I can see the door open. I can see the soldiers come in and manhandle him and lift him up, bound all up, dragging him out of the cell, dragging him down the hallway, out into the light. I can see his eyes squinting in the morning light and and I can see them begin to unbind Barabbas. I can see them unlatch his chains and unbind him. And I can see him looking around wondering, where's the crowd? Where's the executioner? Where's the cross? He doesn't see any of this. And they let him go. And I can imagine him asking one of the soldiers, what's going on? And the soldier says, you're free to go. They're killing somebody else. they, they, They chose the other guy. They're killing him instead of you. I can imagine him being mystified at first. Like this, can this possibly be real? He's, he's got a clean slate, and he's got a second chance, and he's got a brand new future. And then I just wonder, and this is purely my imagination, I just wonder if he heard the crowd and got drawn in and wondered what's going on. I wonder if he was curious about who was going to be hanging on his cross. And uh, I wonder if he followed that crowd. I wonder if Jesus ever made eye contact with him. I wonder if uh, he wandered in the back and watched from a distance. I wondered if... I wonder if he watched Jesus lay down on the cross and open his palms. I wonder if he watched them crucify him and lift him up. I wonder if he stood there and and consumed and took that in. And I wonder what it did to him. Because the point of this story, being in Scripture, and it's in all the Gospels, it's it's a on-scene 3D visual of what was really happening for you and me, that I am Barabbas, and you are Barabbas. And that death, that curse, that suffering, we deserved because of our sin, because of our fallenness. But God in love said, I can't, I can't um, not pour out justice and judgment because I'm good, and goodness requires justice. But I'm so good that I will come and I'll take your cross. I'll go to your death. I'll die in your place and I'll let you go free. I wonder if Barabbas became a believer. We don't, we don't know. We'll find out in heaven. I know this. I think I would have. And um, when I think about me being Barabbas, it compels in me a deep devotion that, that I want to devote my life to this one who loves me so. And I'm glad he's my king. I'm glad he's the truth, and I'm living in the life that he's given to me. So what an amazing study. Um, My friend, if you come across this video and you've never received Jesus, listen to 1 John. And this is the record that God's given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. How do you get eternal life? You believe on Jesus. That's it. You receive him by belief. Jesus, I believe. Come into my life. Save me. Forgive my sin. Be my Savior. I believe. If you're a believer already, I just want to say this story should compel us that this is not the time to fake it. This is not the time to play church. This is not the time to be a marginal or a nominal Christian. Now's the time to be awakened with every fiber of our being, to follow our true king, to walk in his bright light of truth, and to share the life that he offers to everyone while we still have time. So thanks for joining me today. If you're a part of Emmanuel, we had a wonderful day, and I hope you'll catch the live stream of the message. The archive is up on the Emmanuel Baptist Church YouTube channel. Hope you'll join me this week as we continue in to Psalm 83 on growing in the gospel every day. And then throughout the week, in the e- afternoons and evenings, we'll be releasing the prolong- the longer form teaching series called The Big Picture um, and studying the 
the 30,000 foot view of the Bible. How do we understand the Bible from start to finish? So we should have a good week on the Growing in the Gospel YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me today. And thanks, if you're a part of our church, thanks for being part of a wonderful church family. I love you. Hope you have a great Sunday and we'll see you tomorrow.